All right, John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, starting this morning in verse number 15. When Jesus, therefore, perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea, and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Father, thank you now for an opportunity to open up your precious word. Thank you for the songs that we can sing, Lord, about Calvary and about the Savior and about our home you're going to take us to one day. Lord, it, it's, uh, it blows my mind, Lord, just to think about eternity, and it never, never ends. And what a joy that is to those of us that are saved, and what a, what a great big question mark to those who don't know you. And I pray this morning, Lord, if there's anyone in our midst that doesn't know you as their Savior, that that would all be changed today. Today would be the day of their salvation. And Lord, for those of us that do know you as our Savior, may we have a greater and greater appreciation of who you are, and that would cause us to love you more and serve you more. And was all, as already was prayed this morning, Lord, may all the glory and the praise and the honor go to the Lord Jesus Christ and none of it to any of us here. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 6, verse number 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Now that's a strange verse, wouldn't you say? We want to make you, we want to force you to be a king. But the reason for that is, is as we covered last week, Jesus has just fed the multitude with bread in the desert. He has just fed them miraculously with one little boy's lunch, and he took that one little lad's lunch and he fed the entire multitude, 5,000 men, the Bible says. And after that, after that, the people say, you know what, <laughs> you need to be our king. And, they, and, they, and they, come, they meet among themselves, they consult among themselves, and they say, if this man can feed us like this, he needs to be our king. And so they go to Jesus and they start approaching him with the idea of forcing him to be their king. Pretty amazing, huh? Now, I find it very interesting that nobody ever tried to force him to be their king after he told them that they needed to repent. After he uh, preaches in Matthew 23 and calls the Pharisees whited sepulchers and you're outwardly righteous but inward full of dead men's bones and he, he calls out their sin, there's nobody calling, him, calling for him to be their king. And after he, he deals with their sins and after he teaches the word of God like nobody's ever taught the word of God before, nobody is trying to make him to be their king. But after he feeds their belly, then they want to make him king. And again, doesn't that just show human nature? Men have always been more concerned about their body than their soul. And, oh wow, he can feed us, he can supply us with what we need, we're going to force him to be our king. Um, but here's, here's the other thing about that. Um, people like authority for the benefit and the provision that they get out of it, 
but they don't like authority when that authority is telling them what to do. <laughs> and so they think, well, we'll have the best of both worlds. We'll make him be our king, <laughs> which means we have the power to, not be, to make him not be king, and he'll give us what we need, but we'll be the real shot callers here, and we'll have the best of both worlds. Or so they thought. So they thought. But this shows a great truth about human nature that I want to bring to light this morning is that men want a God that is greater than them, but they don't want the greatest. They want a God that is higher than they are, but they don't want the highest. They, they, how many times when you witness to lost people, try to tell them about the Lord, how many times have you gotten the response, well, I believe in a higher power. I believe there's something out there. I believe there's something bigger than me out there. Okay, well, do you believe in the Creator? Well, I'm not ready to go that far. I'm not ready to go that high. Well, well why not? Well, because I want, I want a God that can help me out when I'm in a bind, but I don't want a God big enough to tell me what to do. And that's, that's human nature. And um, I want you to look with me. I want this morning for a few moments, I want to introduce you to that real most high God, the real God that made the universe. I want to introduce, to you, introduce you to him this morning. Go back with me to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43, Isaiah 43. People like being religious, they like maybe belonging to a church or calling themselves spiritual, so they can feel good about the fact that, well, at least I'm not an atheist, but my God's not big enough to tell me what to do. Uh, the Mary statue in the backyard makes me feel good about myself, but it's never going to tell me to stop doing what I like doing. Uh, the uh, St. Christopher hanging in my car is hopefully going to make me not get into a car wreck, but he's never going to tell me to turn off that ungodly music in my car. And So we, we like the God that's a little bit bigger than us, to help us out, but we don't want that God all the way at the top. Men don't want that one. But I want to introduce you to this God this morning. This is what the real living God in heaven has to say about himself. This is not what I have to say about him. This is not what the church has to say about him. This is what he has to say about himself. And the decision for what God you're going to choose is completely up to you. It's completely up to you. As big and as great as God is, He doesn't force Himself on anyone. So you get to decide what God you're going to believe in and what God you're going to choose. But I hope after this morning that the choice becomes pretty apparent, which, which is the better choice for you. But you're going to have to make that decision on your own. But I want to show you this morning what the real God has to say about Himself. Look at Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. <clears throat> Verse number 10, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. You know what the real God said? I predate all the other gods. I was here before any other God. If there's any other God that was formed, he was formed after me, I was here first. <laughs> You say, how do you know, Lord? Because I've always been around. <laughs> no God but me. Look at verse number 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Praise the Lord for that. You know, if the Lord didn't want to save you, if he didn't want to save me, you know there's absolutely nothing you could do about it. <laughs> you know, there, if the Lord said, I'm the real God, there's nobody else but me, and I'm not going to save you, what could you do about it? Absolutely nothing. You couldn't force God to be the Savior any more than they could force Jesus Christ to be king. If he didn't want to save us, we'd all be doomed. Praise the Lord. He says he's the Savior. Look at verse number 12. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? So if you set yourself against this God, and you don't want the salvation that he offers, and the Bible says he destroy, he's going to destroy you, you know what else? There's nothing you can do about that. 
If he intends to destroy you, there is nothing you can do to stop it. You know what he said? He said, I will work and who shall let it? You know what the Lord said? If I intend on doing something, who out there is going to stop me? That's the real God. That's the one that created the universe, the galaxies, all the solar system, planet Earth, you and I. That's, that's what he said. He said, if I'm going to do something, I determine to do something, nobody can stop me. That's the real God. That's the real God. Look at, uh, look at verse number, uh, go to verse 44. Uh, cha- I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, chapter 44. You know, people, people waste a lot of time arguing and debating about whether or not God should have done something or whether or not he was righteous or I don't think he should have done that or I'm angry at him because of this. You know, the Lord is never wrong, but if he was, there's nothing you could do about it. <laughs> if he, He's never wrong. He never does anything wrong, but if he was, what are you going to do about it? Absolutely nothing. So much wasted breath arguing about whether God is right or whether he's not. Hey, hey, you know what the Lord says? I'm the only God up here. I'm the only one. If I want to save, I'll, I, if, I'd like to save you. But if you don't want that salvation, I can destroy you and nobody can stop me. That's the real God. Look at Isaiah chapter 44. Look at verse number 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. I'm the only one. Verse number 8, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are my wit- even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. <laughs> you know, the Lord's sitting up there in the third heaven above the, all the stars, above all the planets, all the galaxies. He's above that, and he says, Is there another God beside me? Because if there is, I haven't seen him. <laughs> I've been, around, I've been around since forever. I'm looking around. I don't see any other God. I'm the only one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You say, is he bragging? Yeah, he is. He has a right to, too. He made everything. <laughs> Absolutely, he has a right to. He said, I'm the only God. I'm the only God there is. Look at Isaiah 44. Look at verse number 24. Verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. You know what he said? When I made the earth, when I made the planets, nobody helped me, I did it on my own. I didn't have any help, I didn't take any advice, I didn't have any counselors, nobody advised me, nobody helped me, I came up with the idea, I planned it, I did it, nobody helped me, I did it on my, I did it on my own, by myself. That's the Lord, that's the Lord. Look at, uh, look at Isaiah 45, look at verse number 5, Isaiah 45, verse number 5. I am the Lord and there is none else. Well, I have, my, I have a religion. I have a God. I am the Lord and there is none else. Now, I, would, I am not this morning going to criticize any other, any other religion or any other God. But the Lord is. The Lord is. And he has a right to because he's the real God. He says, I'm the only one. I'm the only one. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though, hast, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. Rising of the sun in the east, all the way to the west, I'm the only one. You know what he says? I'm not just a national God. I'm not just a tribal God. I'm not a God for one kind of people or one country. I'm the, I'm the God over everything. I'm over all of it. Verse number seven. I form the light and create darkness. Is it light outside? The Lord said, I did that. Is it dark outside? The Lord said, I did that. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. Now, evil in the context is not sin. It's the opposite of peace. He said, I can give peace and I can take it away. I I, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Look at verse number 18. Now, I don't know about you, but I know this Lord. It, he can brag all he wants. He, it's okay with me. It's okay with me. He saved my soul. Verse number 18. 
For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord and there is none else. Verse 21. Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time, who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Again, if you want to say God is unjust, you'd be wrong. But if you want to say that, what could you say, what could you do about it? The God that created everything by himself, the one that's higher over everything. If you did have a controversy, uh, what's the point? (laughs) What's the point? Because you're never going to overcome him anyways. You know what the Lord's saying? I am this high. I am this great. I'm the only God. Look at chapter 46. Chapter 46, verse number 5. To whom will ye liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? Now I like this. I like this. You know, when some great athlete comes along, maybe some basketball star, some football star, you know what they start doing? They start comparing him to great athletes of the past. Nobody's ever scored this amount of touchdowns before. Nobody's ever scored this amount of points before. And they start making comparisons. When was the last time we ever saw something like this? When was the last time somebody ever came out like this? Or maybe in the political realm, some charismatic leader or some, you know, you know, great commander. Or when was the last time we ever saw a leader like this? When was the last time we ever saw someone speak like this? And you know what they do? Someone great comes along and they start making comparisons. Who do you think he's like? Who do you think he's greater than? Is he in this league? Is he, is he in this company? Right? That's what they do. You know what the Lord said? If you were going to compare me to someone, who would you come up with? There's nobody to compare me with. I mean, can you see them all sitting around the table? Bob, uh, uh, let me ask you a question, Jim. Uh, Let's see, uh, when was the last time we ever saw someone create galaxies before? I don't know, Jim. It's been a long time. I don't remember ever seeing that before. It's like the Lord saying, there's nobody to compare me to. I am that great. I am that high. There's, There's no. I don't have an equal. There's nobody you could even compare me to. Praise the Lord. Now, here's the question. Here's the question for you. Here's the thing or thing I want you to consider. Do you see why men want to settle for lesser gods than the real God? <laughs> because that God has power to say you're wrong. He has power to condemn you. He has power to bring you into judgment. So the people want a God. Most people want a God. They want a religion. They, don't, they, don't want, to, they want to feel good about themselves. I'm religious. I'm spiritual. But they don't want that God. They don't want a God big enough to tell them what to do or run their life. Lord says, I'm that big. I'm that big. Now, you see see why men resort to idols and statues and images, and they pray to saints and angels. You you know why they do that? (laughs) They want somebody bigger than them to help them out. They don't want the real God. Lord says, I'm the real God. I'm the real God. Now, look at Isaiah chapter 9. Now, Why are they, remember in our passage in John, why are they forcing, why do they want to force Jesus to be king? Because they don't believe what Jesus said about himself. They think he's in that same category of angels and saints and images. They don't think he's the real God even though he said he was. That's why they want him to be king. Look at Isaiah 9, look at verse number 6. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, uh, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That son, that child that was born in Bethlehem, the Bible says he's the same God you just read about in Isaiah. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. He's the same God. Jesus said in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. 1 Timothy 3, 16 says, God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is that God that you just saw read about in Isaiah. 43, 44, 45, 46. Now the people that Jesus is speaking to in John 6, they don't understand that yet. That's why they want him to be a king. But the Bible says in Isaiah 9, 6, the government shall be upon his shoulder. 
one day Jesus Christ is going to come back as a king. And nobody's going to force him to be king. He's going to force them to allow him to be king. It'll be the other way around. He's going to force his way on the throne. I'm looking for that. I'm looking forward, forward to that. Now go with me back to John. Now I said at the beginning, I said which God you want is completely up to you, and it is. Because that great and mighty powerful God, he could have made you a robot with absolutely no free will, and, and you had no choice but to bow down to him and obey him and serve him. He could have done that. But he gave you a free will. He gave you a free will, so the choice is up to you. Now i got a six-point message here out of these verses. And um, these disciples are on the, on the sea here. They're out, in the st- they're out in the storm. They're in trouble. And what it is, it's a great type of a lost person going through this world. So I got six points, so you, you know. You know when we're coming at least close to the end. All right, here's point number one. Look at verse number 16. And when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. It was, it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. Point number one. A lost man doesn't have Jesus Christ. He doesn't have the Son. It says Jesus was not come to them. If Jesus Christ is not your Savior this morning, this is you right here. Jesus is not come to you. You don't have him. Now look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to show you what, not what I think, what the Bible says about your condition this morning. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 11. 1 John 5, verse number 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now in John 6 it said Jesus was not come to them. You know what that means? That means they don't have the Son. Right? It's a picture, it's a type, showing you what a lost man is like in this world. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. It doesn't say if you don't belong to a church. It doesn't say if you don't belong to a religion or if you've never, never been baptized or given money. It says if you don't have the Son, you don't have life. No Son of God, no life. That's your condition this morning if Jesus Christ is not your Savior. Now look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 11. Ephesians 2, 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, without Christ, without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. The Bible says of those that are without Christ, they don't have a little hope, they don't have a fighting chance, they have no hope, no hope. So if you don't have the Son, you don't have life and you don't have hope. There is no hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You say, well, is there any good news? Yeah, but you've got to hang in there for a while to get there. <laughs> got to hang in there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse number 13. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would, have you, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. No hope. And the context talking about the death. Death of a Christian versus the death of a lost person. Someone who has hope, someone who doesn't have hope. Now you might, you might think you have hope, but when will that hope vanish away? When you close your eyes in death. The Bible says without the Son of God, without Jesus Christ, you have no hope. No hope. Go back with me to Job chapter 8. Job chapter 8. Job chapter 8. Verse 
verse number 11. Job 8, verse number 11. Can the rush grow up without mire? Can the flag grow without water? Whilst it is yet in his greenness and not cut down, it withereth before any other herb. So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish, whose hope shall be cut off, and whose trust shall be as a spider's web. He shall lean upon his house, but it shall not stand. He shall hold it fast, but it shall not endure. I'm telling you this morning on the authority of God's holy Bible, if your hope is anything, is, is in anyone or anything but the Lord Jesus Christ, it will not endure. You're going to lean on it and it's going to fall. It will fail you at your hour of greatest need. Your hope will be cut off like breaking through a spider's web. That's what the Bible says. Any hope, if your hope's on anyone or anything but the Lord Jesus Christ. Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11. Job eleven eighteen, And thou shalt be secure because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee, and thou shalt take thy rest in safety. Also thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid. Yea, many shall make suit unto thee, but the eyes of the wicked shall fail, and they shall not escape. And their hope, their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost. When you, give your, when you give up the ghost, your spirit departs from you. You're not just a body. You have a spirit, soul, and body. When your spirit is given up, your hope is gone. If that hope's in anything but Jesus Christ, it's gone. Now go back with me to John 6. John chapter 6. If you have a marker, you can put it there. We'll keep coming back. John chapter 6. Look at verse 17 again. John six seventeen, and it, uh, and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was now dark. It was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. Point number one: You don't have Jesus without 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 saving faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is not with you. You don't have him. Point number two: You're in darkness. In darkness. Look at Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one. None of these are my opinions. None of these are the way I see it. Every single one of these verses, if you read it, if you look at it, it's what the, it's what the Word of God says, not, not what I say. Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. See that? Wrath of God, unrighteousness, ungodliness, the saints and the angels and the idols and the images and the statues and the prayer beads and the prayer rugs will never reveal their wrath against men. That's why men's okay with them and not the real God. The real God says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Verse number 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The Lord says, you saw what I made, right? <laughs> well, there's no evidence for God. Are you kidding me? Everywhere you look, every direction you look is what I made. Without excuse. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. <laughs> Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Darkened. They didn't want the real God, so their foolish heart was darkened. They can't see the truth. You know why? Because they don't want to see the truth. It's not that they can, it's that they don't want to. It's not that they're completely unbiased, looking at the situation. Now, which one's right? It's, no, I don't want that holy and righteous God. Look at verse, keep reading, look at verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. We don't want that God that reveals wrath and, and, and indignation. How about, how about let's make an image? 
right? We don't want the true God. We knew him. We weren't thankful. It didn't glorify him. How, how, about give, how about give us an image? How about give us a statue to bow down to, right? That's what it says. They changed the glory of God into it, made like an uh, in, un, uncorruptible God into an image. Look at verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. We'd rather worship a cow. We'd rather worship a snake or a bird. We don't want the God that made all those things. We'll pray to angels. We'll pray to saints. We don't want the ones that created the angels and the saints. Too high for us. We want someone a little higher than us because we know we need some help. We weren't looking for all that. Lord says, why don't, you, why, don't you serve me? why don't you serve me? Why don't you look to me? I'm the one that made all those things. Now, go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says their, their foolish heart was darkened. Foolish heart was darkened. Verse number, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now watch this, same sentence, verse 19. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. People who, don't, who want to throw off all restraint don't want to be told no, don't want to be told they're wrong. They don't want the real God because they know the real God's against that sin. And so we want a God, but not the real one. We want a God, not, the, not one that's going to tell us we're wrong. And the Bible says their understanding is darkened. They can't see it. Can't see it. Why? Because they don't want to see it. Don't want to see it. In the dark. Go back with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Verse number 18. John 6, 18. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So they're in a storm. They're out in this sea, type of a lost man out on the sea of life. And he's in trouble. He's in danger. You know what point number three is? Point number three in... Point number three is, you're in danger. You're in danger. If you don't know Jesus Christ, point number one, you don't have the sun. Number two, you're in the dark. Number three, you're in danger right now. Right now. You're in trouble right now. A storm could overtake your ship any moment. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You don't know what step will be your last step, what day will be your last day. You're in danger right now. This morning. Go back with me to chapter 3, right here. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Verse number 18. John three eighteen. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Condemned already. You don't have to wait to find out one day if if you're in danger. The Bible says you're in danger right now if you won't believe. You don't have to wait till you see the Lord to find out how it's going to go. The Lord already told you right now how it's going to go if you don't believe on the Son. You're in danger right now. It's not that you will be in danger. It's that you are in danger right now. Look at verse 36. Verse 36, same chapter. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Right now, if you won't believe, not not that you've never heard before, not that you, you just never considered it before, but if you won't believe, the Bible says the wrath of God abideth on you. Right now, the only thing that's holding back his wrath is his long suffering. Because he wants to save you, he's given you a chance, but, he, but the wrath of God's abiding on you right now. Right now. Look at Psalm 7. Psalm 7. Well, 
Where's the positive? There's plenty of that out there. You need to get a balance. Get the other side. Get the full picture. Psalm 7, verse number 11. Psalm 7, 11. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Every day. Now, you might not perceive his anger because he's in heaven and you're on earth, but the Bible says he is angry with the wicked every day. Every day. The wrath of God abideth on him right, right now. You're in trouble, danger, right now. That's what the Bible says. Now, go back with me to John. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Verse number 19, John 6, 19. So when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, hard to tell, they're rowing, the storm is driving them back. The, they're rowing, the storm is driving them back. And so the Bible says, well, maybe 25 or 30 furlongs. When they had rowed that long, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh into the ship, and they were afraid. Point number four, their own works and efforts are insufficient. Their own efforts to try to save themselves from this storm will not do. They are insufficient. Can't save themselves. They're in danger, and they're trying. They're rowing. They can't do anything about it. They're stuck in the storm. Titus chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 2. Titus chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 2. That's where most men are right now, trying. Well, I don't even know how much they're trying anymore, but trying on some level <laughs> to work their way to heaven. Never get there. Never get there. Titus chapter 3, verse number 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says you cannot attain salvation by your own works. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. The only hope you have is the mercy and the grace of God. The only hope you have. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The fourth point is your own efforts will never, will never save you. You're lost without Christ and darkness and trouble, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now God's offering a gift. you got to take His gift. It's the mercy and the grace of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. As long as you think you're okay by yourself, you're never going to make it. You need to reach out for the mercy and the grace of God. Back with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse number 19 again. So when they had rowed about 5 and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh into the ship, and they were afraid. Point number five is Jesus is available. He's available. Now, he hasn't come to them yet, but he's available. He's drawing nigh into the ship. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ is your Savior, that's your choice, not his. He's available. He wants to save you, but He will not force Himself on you. You're going to have to make that decision on your own. Get two places. Get John chapter 4 and 1 Timothy chapter 4. John chapter 4 and 1 Timothy chapter 4. John 4 verse 42. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. He's not just the Savior of some people or elect people. He is the Savior of the world. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 10. 
For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So guess what? The whole world has a Savior. All men have a Savior. But that doesn't help you until you believe. But He's available. He is there. He is ready to save you. He wants to save you. But you've got to call out to Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, back with me to John 6. John 6. Here's point number 6. Verse number 20. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship. And immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Number six, they heard his word and they willingly received him. Now, you want to get saved, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to hear his word and willingly receive him. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Now, you've heard the word, you've heard it, but have you received it? John chapter 1, verse number 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power. See, you don't have the power. God has to give it to you. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that what? That believe on his name. you got to hear the word, and you got to receive him willingly. He will not force himself on you. Does he have the power? Oh, you bet, he, you bet he does. We read those passages in Isaiah. You bet he has the power, but he's not going to exercise that power. You're going to have to willingly receive him. Now, go back with me to Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44. I'm sorry, go, I'm sorry, before we go there, back to John 6. John 6. John chapter 6. Look at the end of verse, nine, uh, the end of verse 21. Well, verse 21, John 6, 21. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. I don't know if you read over that quickly the first time you read through it, but that's an amazing miracle right there. <laughs> They're, they're in the middle of the sea on the storm. Jesus comes, in, comes by. They receive him into the ship. And what happens? Immediately, they're at the land, whether they, whether they went. The Bible says that salvation is not a process. It's not something you attain over a period of time. It happens in a moment when you trust Jesus Christ. Immediately. Now, there's two miracles Jesus performs in this passage. He walks on the sea. That's... That's pretty amazing. And then when he gets into the boat, whoosh, immediately they're at land. Now, why could he do that? Because he's God manifest in the flesh. He is the same God we read about in Isaiah. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. Almighty God in a body of flesh. you got to trust him for the salvation of your soul. Not the Jesus you made up, the Jesus Christ of the Word of God. He's God manifest in the flesh. Now go back with me to Isaiah, Isaiah 44. And I'm going to, I'm going to read a few verses that I, I skipped over the first time around. Because remember I said at the beginning, it's completely up to you if you want the real God or some other lesser God. It really is. It's up to you. It's your choice. But here's what, not what I have to say about those lesser gods. Here's what the real God has to say about those lesser gods. Good Isaiah 44. Interwoven in all these great boastings about himself, he has some things to say about the other gods. Isaiah 44, verse number 9. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit, and they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. You know what the Lord says? Why are you worshiping something that can't see or know anything? 
Who, say, who would do that? Someone who doesn't want the real God, but doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The Lord says, they, that idol, that image that you're bowing down to, that statue, it can't see, it can't know. Why are you worshiping it? Look at verse number 10. Who hath formed a God or molten a grave an image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, they are of men. You know, people like to criticize us for believing the Bible because they, they want to say, quote-unquote, men wrote it, while they bow down to an idol that was made by men. <laughs> your, oh, your Bible is written by men. The Lord says, your God was made by men. <laughs> Look at verse number 12. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals and fashioneth it with hammers and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry. And his strength faileth. He drinketh no water and is faint. <laughs> you know what the Lord says? The man that made your God, the man that made your image, had to take a lunch break because he was tired. <laughs> now why are you worshiping that God? <laughs> now again, that's not me. That's not me poking fun. That's the real God poking fun. And he has a right to because he made everything. Verse number 13. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule, he maketh it out with a line, he fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with a compass, and maketh it out after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. People like a God that remains in their house doesn't follow them out to all the places that they, they want to go that they know they shouldn't go. You stay right here, don't interfere with my life, I'll let you know when I want to talk to you. Verse 14. He, he heweth him down cedars, and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and rain doth nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn. For he will take thereof, and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it, and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god. <laughs> he maketh a god, and worshipeth it. He maketh a gra graven image, and falleth down thereto. The Lord says, what are you doing? You just made that thing. Now you're going to fall down to it? <laughs> Well, yeah, that, that, that way I'm the real shot caller in my life. I have a God, I have a religion, but I'm really the real one in charge of my life. <laughs> Verse 16. He burneth part thereof in the fire, and with part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth roast and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself and saith, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a God. <laughs> or said, Your God was made with leftover materials. <laughs> the residue. Even his graven image, he falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. Verse number 18, They have not known nor understood, for he, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. And none considereth in, her, in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor, en, nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire, yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof, I have roasted flesh and eaten it, and shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? The Lord says, Every, nobody sees a problem with this here. Everybody's okay with this. Your God can't see. He doesn't know anything. He was made by man. Nobody sees a problem with this. Verse number 20. He feedeth on ashes. Now watch, what's, now watch this. Here's the key right here. A deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? A deceived heart. They were deceived because they didn't want the truth. How could you fall for something like that? How could you believe in something like that? Well, because the real God revealed himself and you didn't want him. So you fell for this. A deceived heart. Now go with me to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Verse number 18. Isaiah 45, 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. Oh yeah, back to him. God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I, have, I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Verse number 20. 
Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that have escaped, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image. And pray unto a God that cannot save. Now here's the, here's the point of the whole matter right here. The gods that people choose to replace the real God, they choose them because they don't want to be judged or they don't want to be condemned. Prayer beads, we'll pray, we'll pray to saints, we'll pray to idols, we'll bow down to images and statues because they're never going to tell me I'm wrong. Here's the other part of the matter. They can't save you either. They don't have power to save you. You're hiding from the real God He has the because He has the power to condemn you, but you're choosing God's. You're right. They won't condemn you. They won't tell you you're wrong, and they can't save you either. They can't save you either. Look at verse 22. Look unto me, and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Those idols, those false gods, those false religions that you're comfortable with, you may be comfortable with them, and I understand that, but they cannot take you out of darkness and into light. They cannot give you hope, and they cannot save you. That's only the real God. Now, here's the other thing people don't consider. They don't consider. They don't consider that that real God with that real power and that real might also loved them. Never seems to enter into their mind. Never seems to, never seem to dwell upon that part too much. You know, those idols and those images and those statues and all those other things, they'll never condemn you because <laughs> they don't know anything anyways. Guess what, they all can't, guess what they also can't do? They can't love you either. Cold, lifeless, dead things that'll never interfere. <laughs> they'll never save you and they'll never love you either. Now look at John chapter 3 and 1 John chapter 4. John chapter 3 and 1 John chapter 4. That God that was big and powerful and mighty and the one that boasted and said, I'm the only one, you know what he also did? He also was manifest in the flesh, went to the cross, and died to pay for your sins because He loved you. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look at John 3. Look at verse number 16. John three sixteen, For God, we just read about Him plenty, For God so loved the world, and again, what if he didn't? <laughs> Nothing you could do about it. Praise the Lord, he did. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's what he wants to do. He wants to save you. He wants to save your soul. Who's standing in the way? Not the Lord, <laughs> your own will. Look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Verse number 8. 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So, if this morning you don't know this real God, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, the choice is up to you, it really is. The choice is up to you what God you want. You can turn away from the real, true, living God in heaven because you don't like what He says about your sin. You're also turning away from the only one that ever loved you to die and, paid and died to pay for those sins. He is the only one that can save you. I hope you trust him today. If you haven't done so, I hope you will. Because he loves you and he wants to save you. Now, for those of us that are saved, you know, Jesus came onto that ship. And as soon as he got on that ship, what happened? Immediately, they were at the land. 
And, you know, that's going to be us one day, going through the struggles of life and the toils of life and dealing with all the problems and all the heartaches. And one day the Lord's going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and we're going to be out of here. And immediately we're going to be on the other side with Jesus Christ. Hope you know him. Hope you know him. There's nobody like him. Nobody to compare. Well, he seems like a good God, but there's no comparison. You walk away from him, you're walking away from the only one that can save you.